musicians. Today, I'm going to talk about how to be a hero. How to save and change lives every day. I'm sure many of, many of us in the room have had an experience where we've saved a person's life, been part of a heroic team. If that's the case, I want you to grab your phones, turn your torch on, and give it a little wave. Come on, everybody, grab your phones, all your, yeah. Even better. Wow. A constellation of heroes. Now, keep that light up if you're saving someone's life right now. Well, I know for sure some of you are right now. It all depends on your perspective. How do you save a life without putting scalpel to skin or picking up a laryngoscope? That's what I'm going to talk about today. How, if you become a public health clinician and an advocate, you can save a life without even having to go to the hospital? There are everyday lifesavers in this room. I know for sure. You may not recognize them. They may be sitting next to you. They may be hidden in plain view, even to themselves. A little bit later, I'm going to introduce you to some of those everyday heroes. But first, I want to tell you a story more than two decades ago, I had an emergency department shift that changed me. It shaped me. I wasn't aware of it at the time, but the experience became etched into my DNA and translated into future research and advocacy. I was working in the emergency department at Western Hospital Footscray. Like many western suburbs of big cities, it was the Badlands. Heroin bathed the streets in an, an ocean of alcohol. It was Australia Day, 1995. On that day, I saw seven women with alcohol-related family violence. Their faces and stories stay with me today. They haunt me, as similar as they were different. A fair-haired IT worker with fractured ribs and a pneumothorax, tears of anger, disbelief. A tall, proud African-American woman she was sick of her partner's behavior while he was drinking. She attacked his beer cans with a knife, piercing their thin aluminum skins with ease and creating an amber cascade. In response, she was beaten so badly that I couldn't tell what side of her face was stoved in and what was swollen but I was sure that the marks around her neck and her, her, her hoarse voice represented attempted strangulation. Broken bones, abdominal pain, an overdose, a simple cut lip. These were the faces and tales of alcohol-related violence that I saw that day. These women, these seven women, survivors of family violence enabled by alcohol, drunk in the name of our National Day. While I was horrified by the violence that I saw that day, I didn't think, how could I prevent it? At that time, 
my advocacy was patient by patient. As a newly minted specialist in emergency medicine, I embraced education and training. That would be my opportunity to do most good for the most people. While education and training was clearly vital, I wanted to find a more potent advocacy tool. Research, I thought. Research is the answer, that's the way. Who believes in research is the most advoc important advocacy tool? Yes, that was me. I bowed at the altar of the randomized controlled trial and I drank from the cup, the Cochrane cup of systematic review, but I was left thirsty and frustrated. Issues of external validity and knowledge translation meant that my research only applied to a small portion of my patient population. Over the years, I've met numerous policymakers. I've told them what my research showed, what the data was. It was clear. But just like throwing dice at a casino, I couldn't win. They didn't listen, and importantly, it had no policy traction. When I was completing my Masters of Public Health, is that better, that sound? Don't be your own sound tech. <laughs> when I was completing my Masters of Public Health, I met a woman called Margaret Hamilton. She's a leading Australian drug and alcohol researcher. She led our Prime Ministerial Advisory Committee on Drugs and Alcohol for two decades. I asked her how to influence policymakers. She told me to use stories and anecdotes to give. Thank you. Thank you. To give data, to make data real, to give it superpowers. Renee Brown, in, in her talk uh, on the power, a TED talk on the power of vulnerability talked about stories as data with souls. Data with souls. Her TED talk in itself is an example of the power of stories. Public health would be my advocacy pinnacle, my opportunity to do the most good for the most people. I thought I'd embrace tobacco harm. But the next thing I did was most important. I asked and I listened to emergency clinicians. I heard their stories. While the overwhelming majority of emergency clinicians support public health, and in fact are doing them in the emergency department, there are barriers, big barriers, around time and resources. And this quote eloquently demonstrates the paradox. Someone who's just bailing ship. In 2010, more than 150 emergency clinicians got together in Australia and New Zealand. I asked them what was their most important advocacy priority. They identified alcohol harm, feeling that it had the most effect on ED attendances, occupational violence and aggression, they were also concerned that previous research had largely underestimated the size of the problem. With studies suggesting anywhere between a half to 9% of ED tendencies were alcohol related, it just wasn't what their reality was. It was this background that led the college to seek and receive funding for its alcohol harm project, and the project had three objectives. Firstly, to quantify alcohol harm on a national scale, Secondly, to understand the effects of alcohol-related occupational violence and aggression on clinicians. 
And finally, to raise community awareness and advocate for change. In 2013, we held our, our first snapshot study. At 2 a.m. on a Saturday morning, more than 100 emergency departments responded, representing an 80% response rate. We found that 15% of attendances were there as a result of alcohol harm, 15% due to a single preventable cause. Shockingly, every region had emergency departments where one in three people were there as a result of alcohol harm. We held a comprehensive media campaign that reached an estimated audience of eight and a half million, about a third of Australia and New Zealand's population. And while the one in three created a powerful soundbite, it was the stories told by passionate clinicians that I think had the biggest impact. The data was released at the same time as some national police data, and it was credited with influencing the New South Wales government's decision to reduce access to alcohol in the Sydney CBD area. Gordon Fordy, the director of St Vincent's ED, found that the so-called lockout laws, which resulted in 3 a.m. closing of venues, resulted in a 25% reduction of the most serious injuries presenting to an emergency department. Following the introduction of the laws, there was a public outcry to keep Sydney open. The government called an inquiry. Justice Callaghan commented that that health professionals and police were the most credible and unconflicted witnesses to his inquiry, and it only resulted in a small increase in access to alcohol. We repeated the snapshot study on Australia Day, in part in memory of those seven women. We found on Australia Day, the day that I've described as our national day of getting drunk, injuring yourself and someone else, that one in seven patients were there as a result of alcohol harm. This is on a Tuesday night. We used New Zealand as a comparison, and they had one in 15. Once again, it was those powerful stories told by powerful clinici clinicians that had the impact. Our more comprehensive study of alcohol harm involved looking at nine emergency departments over a week. We found that not surprisingly, alcohol harm does vary with the day of the week. But as you can see, it's just every day. That equates to a total of almost 10% of ED attendances in Australia and New Zealand being there as a result of alcohol harm. If you equate that to our national census of people attending, that's half a million people a year. Once again, a powerful soundbite. In order to demonstrate the effect of alcohol-related occupational violence and aggression, we surveyed emergency clinicians. The college produced a video to give the data and story life, and I'm just going to play a minute or so of that. I cared for a, a woman who was about my own age. So her husband had been hit by a drunk driver and deceased on the scene and she was unaware of this. She asked for him repeatedly and I was there with her when they told her. So that was a particularly hard day at work. In 2014, 2002 emergency department doctors and nurses in Australia and New Zealand responded to a survey which asked them about their experiences of alcohol-related presentations in their ED. I was obviously pregnant an alcohol-affected patient threatened to punch me in the stomach I was in front of his wife and kids. By an intoxicated patient. They take the up patient a huge amount of resources, especially the trauma-related injuries, at a massive cost to the health system. 
If a patient is in pain or dying, the last thing they need is yelling, abuse and swearing in the cubicle next door. Verbal abuse is an hourly occurrence in my ED. You only need one combative, alcohol-affected patient to completely disrupt the functioning of the department. I've been verbally threatened and physically assaulted, pushed, punched, spat on and bitten. You have no idea what it is like at two o'clock in the morning to be telling the parents of a 22-year-old that their child is brain dead. Dealing with intoxicated patients uh, takes a toll on the staff. It's very tiring and emotionally draining. Every day, every day. And it's not just Friday night, Saturday night. It's every day. The college held a comprehensive media campaign and they were contacted with the release of the video by a major news outlet. They wanted a spokesperson, and as the primary investigator on the study, they suggested me. But the network said, sorry, we don't want to offend, but no. We don't want an academic or a researcher. We want a real ED doctor. <laughs> I was able to put my hand up and say, I have been spat on. And to me, that demonstrated the power of the clinician, the clinician telling their stories. Now let's get back to some everyday heroes. This is David Jacker. He is head of addiction medicine in Melbourne, Australia. Does anyone else think he look a, a little bit like Doctor Who? <laughs> well, he may not have a time and relative dimensions in space blue box, but he has a powerful green box that sits at the front of my hospital. And with needle and syringe exchange vending machines and naloxone providing, prescribing, just like Doctor Who, he can save a life without even being in the same dimension as the patient. This is John Bonning, an emergency physician from New Zealand. His campaign to reduce the the driving limit from 0.08 to 0.05 means that John is saving lives just listening to this talk. John's demonstrating what I call there the pissed off clinician pose. <laughs> John, you've almost got it right. You just need to cross your hands the other way and look a bit more unhappier. <laughs> this is Jonathan Shepherd a face of a maxilla surgeon from Cardiff in the UK. He was sick of repairing horrific facial injuries. His comprehensive last drinks project involves data sharing between ED physicians, ambulance and police. It's been shown to reduce ED attendances with alcohol-related violence to between 30 and um, 40%. Jonathan does not have to pick up a scalpel or prep a patient for theatre. He prevents the punch from happening in the first place. So, what can you do? What you should do, join your society or college's public health committee. Talk to the public health advocates in your region. Share your face, your story, and your data. Give it superpowers. Clinicians, it is time to draw your sword and raise your shield and become everyday heroes. Clinicians, we are powerful witnesses to the major public health challenges facing our society. We can mount a compelling argument for change. It is with data and stories, I believe we can do that best. Thank you. <laughs>